Good morning, we're starting. Well, please take your seats. My name is Jankir Jankirov. I'm a senior vice president at Sberbank. I'm head of risk management. But today, my role is quite different. I'm going to moderate uh, quite an exciting discussion, which is very relevant today, and I think is going to be uh, more relevant uh, uh, from personal perspective rather than professional. Uh, actually, in the past, everything used to be quite simple. In the past, we were uh, making not so many big decisions in life. You were starting to work as a programmer, uh, or as an accountant, or an economist. Then you became senior economist, then chief economist, and uh, this was going on for 40 years. That's what that was uh, the normal, the old normal, and everybody was happy. Today. Uh, uh, there have become uh, much uh, more uh, big decision moments in your life. And one of the big decisions that we have to make is about the profession, what we're going to do. And even uh, professions uh, are coming up uh, every year, uh, new professions. Everybody knows about bloggers, video bloggers. And I recently learned about a profession of miners in computer games, that people who mine are for resources that you can uh, exchange for uh, real money. And so talking about video games, uh, there's cyber sport. There's, uh, it's an area where professional cyber sports people are earning uh, a comparable uh, amounts uh, to uh, professional uh, sports people in classic sports. And you can't ignore that, of course. Uh, it's all uh, about a very serious change. All uh, this competition in sports and, sounds and cyber sport attracts uh, huge audiences, uh, sports people get prepared for that. And I mean, we can go way beyond uh, this list. All, all these changes make us continuously think, uh, work on ourselves, what to do next. Uh, when I was graduating the university, I uh, was specializing in mathematics, economics, finance. I didn't expect this, that when you uh, get uh, to uh, the, uh, when you get a job, you'll always have to continue to learn. But the most important thing is that the skills, what's called soft skills, turned out to be uh, an even more needed thing uh, than uh, the hard skills. How to build a relation with colleagues, how to present your idea, how you should select the right people uh, to uh, join your team when hiring. So all these questions uh, that we are going to discuss today. And the good news is that uh, we are not going to struggle alone. We're going to have three professionals uh, with us uh, who are dealing with these questions uh, professionally, uh, three researchers uh, who uh, know about all these areas better than anyone else. Uh, so the rules are like this. We're going to have uh, three presentations, uh, about 20 minutes each, after which I'll ask a number of questions. And if we've got some time left, uh, uh, people from uh, the audience will also be able to ask their questions. I'd like to address my first question to Stephen. Stephen is a professor in neurosciences and strategic leadership. Uh, he's a professor uh, at uh, the Antwerp uh, Business School and also IADA Business School. He's also a consultant uh, for uh, a lot of companies, a consultant at Neuro Training Lab, but also a professor in Mail Access. Uh, Stephen, as an expert who's had a lot of experience uh, with large uh, companies and other companies, how would you uh, define requirements uh, for leaders today? How, uh, what's the way for companies to attract those people and how they should develop them? Good morning. 
Um, times uh, are changing, right? Um, and also the way of attracting talent. I think nowadays, uh, young people are not just looking for a job. They're looking for a sense of meaning. They're looking for a sense of purpose. They're looking for a project uh, they can realize their dreams in. Uh, it goes further than just uh, doing a job. It's about realizing their lives through their work. Um, just a little fact, this is a uh, result from the Boston uh, Consulting Group in collaboration with the European um, Association of Personnel Managers. They found that for young people, and especially in Eastern Europe, um, corporate social responsibility uh, coincides with work-life harmony. How do you explain that? Right? How, how can you connect those two ideas? Well, the only way to understand it is that if people feel they work for a company that has not just a bottom line, but has a social responsibility, they understand that through their work, they can realize uh, a social responsibility. Through their work, they can contribute to a better society. So that's a big change. That does, what does that mean that companies now have to go further than just offering a job? They need to offer a project. They need to offer a sense of purpose to young people. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, you may continue with your, uh, with your presentation now. OK, thank you very much. All right. So. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain and then more specifically how we connect this with uh, leadership. And thank you for your attention beforehand. Um, to get started, I would like to quote um, Yuval Harari, who is a, uh, a very well-known scientist. Uh, this is uh, something he said at the uh, Davos um, meeting this year. The human species stands on the verge of a 21st century biological and socio-economic revolution driven by engineering bodies, brains, and minds. That's, uh, that's quite a phrase, right? Let's just focus on one particular part, which is uh, engineering the brain, because today we're going to talk about the brain. Maybe the word engineering um, uh, requires a few steps before. Right? Before we can engineer, before we can build, we probably have to understand. And before we can build, we have to understand the bricks and the mortar. We have to understand how the brain is built. And just um, uh, as a point of reference, um, uh, let me show you some numbers. Um, the research of Susana Herculano Roussel, who's a Brazilian researcher, who actually did the effort to count the number of neurons in the brain, she came up with uh, the staggering number of 85 billion neurons. That's uh, 85, and I'm looking at my notes here, don't make any mistakes, that's 86, sorry, with, <laughs> yes, with nine zeros, right? That's the number of neurons. Just as a, as a comparison, there are 250 billion stars in the galaxy. So we're getting very close. But then if we combine this, if we multiply this number by the number of synapses, which is the interconnections between neurons, um, which can vary between 1,000 up to 300,000 in the cerebellum, right? But say on average, maybe 7,000 or very conservatively speaking, 1,000, we come to a number of 86 trillion neural connections. Um, if we divide this by the number of stars in the galaxy, we have about 344 galaxies in our brain. You have literally like many, many galaxies between your two ears. Right? So in order to, uh, to grasp this complexity, right, we understand that we will need international collaboration. Uh, a lot of um, smart minds working together to decodify this wonderful piece of uh, equipment we have between our two ears. Um, this is where my fascination came from. But now let's uh, turn to the organizations and 
Uh, that's sort of the topic also of this, um, of this GuideR conference. The organizations that are first to develop the capacity to collect, store, or analyze, or apply, or enrich in some way data, right, to improve performance and well-being will be the strategic leaders of the future. Um, there is no way of escaping. Each and every single organization should be interested in how to get the best out of our brains. Our societies are evolving towards knowledge societies, service societies, and knowledge cannot be disconnected from the individual. So if we take care of the person, we will take care of the knowledge. If we take care of the person, we will take care of the service they can provide. What else do we know? Well, in the fourth wave, this is the, the wave we are um, living now, I think we will see in the near future the massive real-time measurement of biopsychological indicators. Right? Imagine you're wearing glasses, and in these glasses there's technology incorporated that measures the dilatation of your pupil. And it will actually register right, at any, any point in time which draws your attention. Maybe you will be wearing smart clothing, and inside of your clothing there are sensors included that allow you uh, to measure your biometrical activity at any point in time and maybe give you warnings about whether you're too stressed, yeah? you have too much stress and you have to cool down a little bit before making a decision. Right? Um, of course, if you have all this data coming in in real time, we will need big data and artificial intelligence in order to sift through all this data and come up with patterns. Uh, this artificial intelligence will help us to decodify and to write algorithms to understand better and to prevent health issues, right? to improve our performance. Uh, and that's the whole idea. Um, how quickly will companies move to actually work in this way? This is uh, to be seen, but it is clear that there's no way to avoid it. Let me talk a little bit about the Neuro Training Lab. This is the methodology um, I've developed with my team to actually put this uh, into practice. Right? Just to give you an idea, imagine you're participating in a program, in a developmental program. The night before or the night before you receive a case, you need to read a story, and now you have to prepare for it, not just to discuss it in the classroom, but actually to execute it. And you have to intermediate in a conflict. You have to show your leadership in a particular context. And on the other side of a one-way window, we will be observing you. And using a special software called Equalia, we are going to register everything you say, how you say it, and, and when you say it. Connecting it at the same time, using special headsets to measure your EEG activity, your electroencephalographic activity, we can actually uh, connect at any point in time when you were doing something what was happening in your brain in real time in the very, very, very moment. This allows us to give a much more detailed type of feedback to people. The feedback that really works, maybe the only feedback that works, is contingent and task-based. What does that mean? Right after doing the exercise, we give feedback to leaders so they learn about what they've done well and learn about what they can do better and the next time. And through a number of sets of neuro training lab exercises, we actually put managers in a real social context and see how they do. I personally believe that as management schools, we have failed. We have failed to develop leadership. You cannot develop leadership by talking about it in a classroom. You develop leadership by doing, by hitting your head against the wall and feeling the blood, right? And correcting, and doing it again until you get it all right. This is the basic uh, research model we use in the Neuro Training Lab. We try to um, uh, predict uh, leadership performance by looking at competencies. What are competencies? These are observable behaviors right? that are associated with high performance and that can be translated in specific indicators to know exactly what you're doing and whether you're doing it in the right way. But we also know that it is easy to be a leader in time and peace. 
it is much more difficult to be a leader in times of war. So what we do also in the lab is we consciously, we deliberately create a stressful environment to see how people deal with this. We work with actors that will respond in an emotional way uh, to see how leaders deal with these emotions. And while we do this, right, we look under the surface and we look more specifically at the activity of the prefrontal cortex, the seed of our personality, the seed also of our deliberate conscious thought. Right? And we look at to what extent are leaders actually self-regulating? To what extent are they focused? Are they showing attention in different moments in time? And very important, we will come back to this, uh, I come to back to this in a moment, we will also measure the levels of metacognition. What is metacognition? It's the cognition about cognition. Right? It's the capacity to look at yourself from a third-party perspective. Uh, while you're having a conversation with a person, it's like you're stepping outside of the situation and look at yourself. We found in our neurotraining lab, and this is a main finding, that metacognition is one of the best predictors of leadership. So, what have we learned? What have we learned after seven, eight years of observation of leaders in the neurotraining lab? And I'm going to use the, the picture of the paradox. And the best way to understand the paradox is to look at the sign of yin and yang. Think of two complementary forces that seem to be opposite of each other. They're very difficult to, be, to combine. It's very difficult to come to this harmony between those two very different types of things. You can't do both things at the same time. That's sort of a, a paradox. Right? Well, we know from research, neuroscience research, that there are different neural circuitries that are to be activated, um, but they, from a biological point of view, cannot be activated simultaneously. It is simply impossible to activate different, different neural circuitries at the same time. Still, what we see in our neurotraining lab, great leaders switch back and forth between paradoxical behaviors as if it was the most normal thing of the world. Right? They self-regulate to switch back and forth between those antagonistic, contradictory activities. Now, what are some of these paradoxes that we found in our neurotraining lab? Okay? The first paradox we found is declaring versus inquiring. Let's just say speaking versus listening. A great leader doesn't just talk and talk and talk. A great leader listens. And actually in our lab we found that great leaders spend more time listening than talking. Right? Of course you need to do both and that's the paradox. You need to speak, of course. What we found what is very important in, for a leader is to frame every meeting and start with explaining the purpose of, of the meeting. Obviously to argue, but also to engage um, uh, and show their engagement towards a certain topic. But we also found it's very, very important to have a um, listening style, to observe, to understand what's going on on the other side of the table. The paradox consists in switching back and forth between those two styles and know exactly when is the right time to switch between one and the other, right? I like metaphors of nature. This is not what I'm referring to, right? It's quite the contrary, right? Let others speak and speak their minds. Second paradox. We found that especially engineers, when they start a meeting, they immediately focus on the problem. Where it's, this is another paradox, right? We need not just to focus on the task and the problem, on the goals and the results. That's a typical approach of a manager. No, great leaders, and this is how they distinguish themselves from managers, are also focused on the process, on developing trust and building a relationship. Once again, the neural circuitries that are needed to, to, to have those two activities going are antagonistic. They literally inhibit each other. It is impossible to do both at the same time. So great leaders, once again, switch back and forth between those two states. We found that people are very good in meditation, and that's also something we measure as part of our protocol, are better in managing emotions. 
Paradox number three, one of the biggest paradoxes of leaders. Do I keep control? Do I check? Do I double check? Right? Do I take into account everything that can go wrong? Or do I trust in the people I work with? Do I give them some leeway? Do I give them um, some discretion in making decisions? Do I support them? Do I coach them? Once again, some of the managers are completely and utterly focused on control and control only. Right? Maybe to make a little joke, right? this is a, uh, a little joke. This is a person who says, as long as I have everything under control, uh, I can be very flexible. That's not what we have in mind, right? And then the last paradox. The last paradox is about being able to switch from different levels of analyses. Switching between being a representative of the firm and of course represent the common goods, the vision of the firm, the policies and the norms, but at the same time switching back and forth and giving more attention to the individual needs of individuals sitting around the table checking their personal interests, understanding their expectations, understanding how they are different, each one of them, and have different expectations bringing to the table. Once again, managing this paradox requires switching back and forth between those paradoxical states. And here I'm going to end my talk. This requires metacognition, right? It is thinking about the thinking. This is why we understand that leaders need to develop their metacognition, their capacity to step out of themselves, look at themselves, be self-critical, and tell themselves, you have to switch, you have to go now to a different mode, because if not, you will not get to any results. I wish you a lot of luck. I hope you will develop your metacognition over the next coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen. Now, my next question should be addressed to our esteemed speaker, Ms. Chernigovska. She's a doctor, she holds a doctorate degree in biology. Stephen spoke about leadership skills and the development of these skills it takes uh, from you to get out of comfort zone. And we're talking about higher pace of development of the world. We're talking about new technology. What about us as biological beings? Are we able, are we capable of that? Can our brain, can our brain withstand that pressure? Okay, thank you. Now I'll respond to all of your questions. Now, yesterday I did an interview for a Cultura TV channel, and some of the cameramen said, uh, so whispered to each other, oh, Chernigovska will now start to uh, uh, in, uh, will start to instill fears in all of us. Uh, we'll tell horror stories. So I'm not going to tell horror stories. But what I'm showing you is, uh, is, is a creature I call Homo Confusus. A person doesn't know what to do. You're at a loss, you're puzzled, you're perplexed. For good or bad, the civilization is developing in this way. We are in it. We don't have a ticket to get out. So we sh there should be no illusions about it. We just need to figure out how to live in this world. And I'll put it in a hard way. Are we planning to continue to live on this planet or are we giving up? Because if we are giving up, uh, giving way to the digital world where there's nothing to talk about. We can go out for a coffee break straight away. If we do have plans for our own human life, then we need to think how we can live in this human life, on this human world. We are as we are because we have the brain that we have. Well, again, we didn't talk earlier on how we did our presentations, but you can see that a lot of things that coincide. We live in a world of information, run and ruled by information, and humans uh, 
differ from other uh, from other species. We use uh, a system of symbols. We live in a world that we've uh, created uh, on our own. We can use signs, symbols, uh, that we talk about language, music, math. We are because we have a brain like this that can play with such complex uh, things. We do have a most complicated neural network. Uh, the number of synaptic uh, knots uh, where some parts of the brain connect to other parts of the brain, well, they to the tune of quadrillion. I could spend some time on giving you some more figures. But I don't currently have it. But if we start to count the number of those connections, so it could be 10 and then 85 uh, zeros after it. So it's not just m more than stars in the planet, it's even more than the number of uh, the particles on the planet, in the world, in the universe. So there's another maybe question of who belongs to who, our brain belongs to us or we belong to the brain, but that's a separate discussion. Now talking of the digital world, we're going to repeat, although we cannot repeat because we don't know how the brain operates, but they say that our brain is a computer, here are the alg algorithms, here are this zero, one, you know. But is it just algorithm as part of our brain? We often know that it's not just the algorithm. It could be a computer, but not one. I mean, in terms of the type. Part of the brain is algorithm, and you have these mechanical cogwheels, uh, bolts and stuff things. But another part is analog things. We can talk about quantum computers. So quantum computer could be a better metaphor for our brain. So Korsakov is here for a reason. Before, long before the Turing, he started to do intellectual machines. So the forefather of intellectual, of uh, artificial intelligence uh, is Korsakov. Turing came later. And then AlphaGo, these... Uh, this horrible program. Uh, uh, we also need to think of other areas. As I said, there are analog things. Even big scientists, I'm not even talking about poets, take Einstein. Intuition is a sacred gift, and your intelligence is a humble servant. I've read uh, a lot of works by Einstein, don't know why, but it's so fascinating. He says, a new idea comes suddenly in a rather intuitive way, but intuition is nothing but the outcome of earlier intellectual experience. I believe in intuition and inspiration, for knowledge is limited. And again, you get the knowledge from inspiration and not because of calculations. So what's going to be next? You've got Charlie Chaplin, two characters. So what's the world ahead of us? Where are we going? Why does it click? A, doesn't work. Why doesn't click a work? It all started earlier. 1996, Kasparov was beaten by a deep blue, and it was a shock. The, be, the best brain on the planet was humiliated by some piece of metal. But when people woke up, they realized it's just a different story. It was a bit dishonest because the computer doesn't have the nerves. It uh, has uh, boundless memory. It doesn't uh, get tired. And again, this particular software was uh, adjusted and adapted for this particular 
uh, for this particular grandmaster. Then Kramnik lost to Deep Fritz. And okay, we realize we cannot compete uh, with these uh, metal things in terms of calculation. But there are games like Go, and I said, okay, Go might be beaten. But what about poker? I thought that poker is all about bluff. Is what about your poker face, your duck glasses? So it's all about humans. And okay, Alpha Go beat Go champion four to one. DeepMind then created this particular software, AlphaGo, so without any initial knowledge. They just give you the rules and they learn, it learns to play and it can beat any other software or any beam. So I have asked them how do they do it and again it actually plays with itself. So it's like a clone, it creates a clone and it plays a million, a million rounds. I mean, you cannot play a million rounds. Uh, and then I was beaten. Artificial intelligence liberties uh, won 1.8 million uh, in poker. I don't know how they did it. But, you know, it has touched me in a way. I mean, I've been moved by that uh, somehow. So we are now living in quite a different world. It's fluid, it's transparent and not stable. It's uh, extra rapid, it's hybrid, uh, it's insulating. Everything's been shaken. Uh, I've got people who do posts uh, on uh, social media for me. But when, you, uh, when you're on Facebook, for example, you tend to think that who's on the next uh, uh, side of the screen is uh, a human being too. But it might not be that way, actually. We see new things like uh, Internet of Things, self-organization of uh, networks. I mean, if, uh, if a country cannot enter the digital world, it means the country does not exist. They could do handicrafts, but they're not part of the global economy. And there's growing distrust to information. I've been thinking hard about it. You know, information now is now treated just like gossip was treated 30 years ago. You know, people say some things, but should I trust this information? No. So currently we have this distrust towards uh, big uh, sort of, you know, authoritative sources of information. And I often ask the qu a question to my friends. And it's a broader question about the digital world. We've got Skalko, we've got Silicon Valley. And they keep telling, OK, we're going to figure it out. We do have Da Vinci, we have do other robots. Now, here's a question to all of you. Well, if something happened and you're being told Da Vinci will do a surgery like no other, what are you going to do? I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I will start getting feedback. I will get gossip. I will ask all of my friends, those who might know, those who are good in diagnostics, a good specialist in diagnostics would not tell you how they do these diagnostics. They just see it. They just see it. They cannot explain. It's not because they they don't want to tell you, but it's just because they cannot tell you. It's intuition. It has to do with any data mining specialist. And those who can explain, well, we don't need that pe those people because all of that knowledge is already in textbooks. So what are our anxi anxiety all about? And you've got a syndrome of a delayed life. You live like uh, currently you just have a draft life. 
and even children are brought up in a way you can do this and that and when you start to have a real life then you'll be able to do it no no way children start a life when they are a, a fetus you cannot keep a person for 20 years uh, somewhere telling them then big life would come somewhere and uh, we sometimes also face a situation uh, when a civilization doesn't know what to do with uh, all of its uh, well-being and propriety, like take ancient Rome. Now, there's another area. When uh, everyone says that there'll be robots that will replace us, uh, what will we do? What will we do except for hard labor? And everyone starts saying, okay, we'll have more creativity. So do you expect people to start writing poems and play music? No, the opposite will happen. So this homo confuses, it doesn't, he doesn't have a clue where he is. Because he's on the tracks, reading a newspaper, he doesn't have a, an idea of a, the danger that we are in. The decision is has to be made here and now. So we have Niels Bohr and Einstein. And Confucius also applies to science. So what did Niels Bohr say? Physics is not about how the world is. It is about how we can say about the world. And that's the Nobel laureate. If we had a housewife, a coach potato, well, no one would, well, no one would care, but that's the major physicist. Everything what we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. Again, we're looking at... Uh, we're looking ahead to, to the quantum world. So if it cannot be regarded as real, where we are? So here's the table, here's the rostrum, here's the mic. But what's inside? Do we have... What, what else do we... What, what else? What, what do we have there? Strings or what? And Niels Bohr also said, no, no, you're not thinking, you're just trying to be logical. Just like all the tests, and Mr. Smoloff would uh, subscribe to it. Uh, people are smart if you can count quickly. I don't count quickly, but I don't think I'm stupid. So you need to distinguish you know, if you count well, fine, you're good in math. But okay, if I am, if I am interviewing candidates, I don't want someone who can count because I've got a computer. A computer can count everything. I need someone who's crazy, people who do things in an, an original way, people who are disruptive, people who talk nonsense. That person would be a Niels Bohr. Well, he's already a Niels Bohr. Well, here's another quote from uh, Wittgenstein. He's a linguist. He invented a very good metaphor. He introduced the kind metaphor of a carpet. Every reader draws out his own thread out of it. Fundamental observer dependence. If you have no concept, you have no understanding of what you register. If you have a, uh, I don't know, some old manuscript, but if you don't have the person who can read it, then this manuscript is just a physical object. But what we read from it depends on my education, on whether I do have a brain or not, what, what are my plans, why I'm reading it. So there's a huge, a long list of uh, factors that influence it. So we cannot say that people are not important. People are important because they organize information. Information isn't up in the air, is it somewhere in the air? I mean, it's neutral, but we organize it. It's humans who organize it. I do have questions and I would like to put to you and I don't have answers. 
does the brain itself has any logic? So I work with the Institute of Brain, and sometimes we look at the data and we say, well, you know, the brain, it's not logical. The brain shouldn't be doing it. But does the brain actually need my opinion? But in order to do, why, why do we need to know how the brain works? Do we need to create a clone? No, I don't want a clone. I don't want artificial intelligence to replace us. We can create good washing machines or uh, um, coffee pots, but okay, fine, but not artificial intelligence to replace us. Okay. What about the brain? What kind of physics does it belong to? Can a brain be stupid? That's a question that came to my mind. Can a brain be stupid? So the brain of an imbecile, it's still the most complicated, the most perfect thing in the universe. It sounds like a trivial question, but it's a serious one. If there are a quadrillion neuron knots, then it's still a perfect thing. But can we distinguish between a the brain of a genius and the brain of an imbecile? Well, it did it on its own, sorry. So again, who belongs to who? So the brain definitely is a set of operations, but it's not just that. It goes beyond that. So what about artificial intelligence? Is it going to be a smart artificial intelligence? What would that mean? Is it fast? Oh, s stupid is slow? No? Okay, what kind of artificial intelligence would that be? Okay, what if there's a brain of a genius? Does it switch fast, as you said? R really? Is it the one that counts quickly? No, it could be a low IQ person, but without you know, retentive memory. Well, we know that from medicine. What about a uh, what about the uh, genius level artificial intelligence? But not because of speed. But how do we know it's a genius? How do we know that it's a personality? But there is a danger like that. And. Uh, you know, we don't have absolute artificial intelligence, we just have good software. But if we do have artificial intelligence, real artificial intelligence, it means that it has consciousness. We don't know what it is. It's another thing. But okay, it will have its own consciousness and it has its own personality, the feeling of I am. And it could cause catastrophic consequences. You won't be able to delete it because it's going to be a, a murder. So we, we would need to overhaul law. So uh, legal concepts, the legal doctrine has to change some bits of it. And ethics, morality, what about that? So if a drone, you know, is the cause of an air crash, who's going to be the person to blame? And that artificial intelligence has to have some moral principles enshrined in it. Uh, who is can uh, uh, knock down or, or kill or not. So can this artificial intelligence have a self-consciousness, independence? Can it have its own self? So we cannot really check it. We cannot really test it. It's like a perfect software. Now, how do you know I'm a person? Maybe I'm a good software. How do you know I am Chernigovska? Well, you can do it as good as alive. What about AI uh, feelings? Will it suffer? Will it have uh, empathy? Will it feel pain? Or will it just imitate it? Well, if we had experts that will be doing that, they would be telling, okay, we do national robots, they would smile. We have emotional robots, but it's going to be all false. It's just a simulation, emulation. There's no pain, there's no death in this digital world. It will 
drastically change uh, everything. So training does change our brain. Our neural net network has changed because it changes every millisecond. Training physically changes the brain, it improves physically, not generally, but physically. But the world has ceased to be a place for just humans. All of the digital systems uh, operate in a world or in a verse or in a dimension where humans don't exist. In nanometers, nanoseconds, there is no human life. And this is exactly the systems that will take decisions. And don't uh, you know, console me that, uh, again, it's only the humans who are going to push the button. No, I don't believe it. It depends on the information. What kind of information will the AI provide to that operator? And the world is transparent, we know. We do have our smartphones in our pockets. And it leads to a review of basic moral norms and values and convergent education. It's a new civilization. And we need a new type of education. And I'm sure Professor Asmalov will give you a better understanding of next generation training. OK, if uh, a 18-year-old uh, child could say, OK, Google and uh, Google will provide all the information, why do they need to go to a classroom where a poorly educated uh, teacher would try to teach them? Mr. Kuzminov always says, OK, let's switch to online education fully. But my previous part, what it's about is that we shouldn't lose humans. If we are giving up, okay, fine. Do you want to be treated by a doctor that got uh, online education? I don't want such a doctor to treat me. I don't want a pilot to uh, navigate uh, the, uh, the skies uh, on the plane where I'm flying. We need to preserve the best of humans, the best of human in us. Everything boils down to the fact whether you can have a good relationship with your family, with your children, with society, with the community. How do you able to work under pressure? How do you, are you able to maintain sanity. We cannot let our children down. Ch our children should know what to do in this forest, in this wild, wild forest. So, summing up, last year I was invited uh, I know, to the speak at the Hermitage uh, Museum. Uh, Finland is round the corner in St. Petersburg, and the uh, Consulate of Finland invited us uh, to talk about the new architecture of education. I thought architecture is like sort of a metaphor, metaphor, but it's it they they, they don't think it of a metaphor. They are now rebuilding their schools. They do it in a different way. They are colorful. They don't have any. Uh, it's all fluid. Uh, rooms. Uh, are not solid. So children can study there, they can study at home, they sit in one room, they sit in another room, they're taught by one teacher and then by another. It's good, they are ready for change. Okay, talking of the leader, the leader should not be afraid, the leader should ignore advice. No one's doing it. Exactly, no one's doing it, that's why you should do it or be quieter. No, just tell everyone to F and then th three dots off. OK, you need to run a risk. You need to be responsible to run a risk for the entire company. Otherwise, you're going to fail. All of the other game, all the other plays have been played. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Tatiana Vladimirovna. I'm sure uh, this 
presentation has touched everybody. And just continue your uh, thoughts uh, about papyrus. Uh, I, th I think everybody has had uh, somebody for relevant to their own. I would now like uh, to switch uh, to Alexander Asmolov, I think. It's another person that doesn't uh, require introduction. Uh, it's uh, director uh, for humanities at uh, Ranepa, uh, I can list uh, his hats uh, for a long time. Uh, so, uh, Professor Smolov, uh, if we continue what uh, Tatiana Vladimirov mentioned, saying that leaders are those who break stereotypes, those who send everybody uh, go far away. So how to bring up this competency, how to motivate people to break a stereotype uh, and create new realities? Uh, right in front of our eyes. Uh, an extraordinary process is happening. So presentations that one after another are challenging, making challenges and breaking stereotypes. Tatiana, you've just mentioned that we are not uh, going to become swine. You were risking, you were taking a risk of saying that uh, at the year of pig. That's why we're all leaders here. I understand uh, it's not a very proper or politically correct uh, statement, but uh, it can actually change us somehow. But at the same time, I'll say that even though we haven't agreed on that, uh, but I'd like uh, to bring the audience's attention uh, to several things happening with us. Uh, the great thinker, Seneca, said, don't agree with me, at least in, some, in something, so that there should be two of us rather than one. Uh, pay attention at this phrase. I am overcoming this uh, phrase. Overcoming this phrase, I start uh, with voicing my agreement. I agree with Stephen uh, in that uh, in, in what he said about the uniqueness of the brain and the capabilities uh, that metacognition knows. And saying this. I'm uh, bro uh, th throwing a challenge to the masters of neurolinguistic programming, something that you mentioned. Uh, as to Tatiana Vladimirovna, it's difficult for me uh, not to agree with her, because when you love someone, you feel uh, that, I mean, you no longer have an AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Let me start uh, with a few strokes of a brush, disclosing a secret. I was attending strategic sessions of the Gaida Forum, and uh, I was uh, doing a bit of diagnostics while <laughs> doing that. And I keep, oh, well, while doing these diagnostics, I was looking at different statements at different symposia. I'm not going to list them all. But uh, there's a whole a range of subjects, of topics, and statements that I heard that, uh, I, that brought me uh, to certain ideas. Uh, statement number one, wherever you go, Everybody is forecasting, is predicting. In actual fact, uh, the Gaida Forum came up as a unique uh, competition of Cassandras. And in this sense, uh, remember the Russian uh, songwriter and help me. Cassandra, how did it go? A crazy girl, I see Troya going uh, to dust. 
and forecasters, just as predictors, have always been brought to fire in every century. Yes, indeed, it's very difficult to predict. As one of the Nobel laureates said, uh, one thing that's especially difficult to predict is the future. And at the same time, in the flow, the stream of these uh, predictions, I've heard several lines, several ideas that we need to understand. Uh, they carry different names. Uh, I, uh, the most caution I uh, profess is to adaptive uh, typologies, because those who are coming up with uh, typologies uh, are killing uh, individuality. The master of typology Hippocrates, I'm not uh, going uh, to try and diagnose you who are sanguine, who are choleric out of you, but today, at our day and age, new typologies come up and they uh, wander about uh, type uh, symposia. In one of the symposiums, someone says, uh, the humanity day splits in three types. First, cyber optimists. Second, cyber pessimists. And third, style uh, is often uh, mentioned. I'm talking about uh, new uh, types, cyber pragmatists. Uh, one other category uh, that uh, wonders about our, uh, uh, our minds, technophobes and technophiles. I'm uh, just mentioning new typologies, and it's not uh, an accident uh, that I'm uh, mentioning this, because quite often uh, we uh, put forward a certain typology and then start adjusting everything we see to fit them. I'm just repeating what I always say. Uh, Stephen uh, mentioned that, uh, and uh, Tatiana mentioned that. Uh, what was the key word? Paradox. Where there's a paradox, where uh, there's uh, a, a carnival, uh, or where there's a Charlie Chaplin uh, that was mentioned in one of the slides, colleagues. I am speaking today not as a cyber pessimist and not even as a cyber pragmatist. Uh, may I give you a name, give you a tag, don't you object? Looking at Stephen, your typology, I suggest another typology for you. You know, there's a, there are unique words. Uh, that AI will not uh, uh, pass, uh, you know, to steal. Uh, there's a slang word for steal in Russian. So let them try and translate that. I will steal uh, from what you've said, saying that using biometrics and other methods, uh, uh, you uh, can put some diagnostic on a leader. And in the response to that, I'm saying you are uh, a brilliant, and there's a new typology, I thought over it overnight, neurocognitivist. Co -cognitivist. So there are neurocognitive pessimism, neurocognitive optimism. I'm uh, not talking neuro, I'm talking neurocognitive because I'm almost modern. And there's neurocognitive uh, uh, pragmatists. Please don't uh, put uh, any uh, assessment value into my words. And when, Stephen, I say that you uh, have found and you're working with unique uh, biometric diagnostic methods, and when you're saying that you can help leaders, I believe you. I like it, but uh, I'm a bit confused. Uh, as, uh, what did you say, Homo Con Confucius? I'm saying, look, uh, we had a colleague. His name was John Watson. You remember him a bit. He uh, created behaviorism and in 2013 proposed a schematic uh, that uh, we apply in different countries of the world. What's his name? It's a stimulus and response. I uh, love American psychology textbook. Uh, there are two sections there, Russian behaviorism and American behaviorism. Uh, Russian behaviorists are Pavlov and Bekhterev, and American are Skinner, Watson, and so on. Watson said, we must prove that a human is no more uh, than a skein of, of uh, uh, unanalyzed, unanalyzed protoplasma. How many of you here skeins of unanalyzed protoplasma? And so what confuses me? 
you know, we have it as uh, our colleague says, uh, we have critical thinking being developed here. So what confuses me is the following. He said, a stimulus response, and then uh, the hero of our age come up, uh, like Dawkins, for instance, and they propose what, uh, following Watson, uh, uh, also uh, apply uh, the gene, of behavioral gene. Notice, uh, I don't see any difference. And then, finally, uh, may uh, a lot of uh, neurocognitivists uh, come up and say, neuron thought, pay attention, three logics, uh, stimulus response, a behavioral behavior gene, and a thought neuron. And one of the heroes, his name was Vanya Solnishka, uh, he used to say, uh, you're not right, from one of the Russian novels. We're simplifying everything a lot. Nothing reduces either uh, to stimulus response schemes where our brain uh, was uh, proudly uh, called a black box. I don't call you a black box. I'll call you uh, white mountains. Uh, no. Uh, uh, and it's not uh, your uh, sand uh, deserts have become uh, white uh, lands, but all of these has not been uh, noticed, uh, and we're still uh, guessing uh, whether it's this or that. Uh, we are still uh, trying uh, to climb up. Uh, let's do it in our lifetime. Alpha rhythm, uh, you, you won't be able uh, to uh, see uh, what you want uh, by going, making a shortcut. Can I make a small experiment? I'm always asking. Because and thank you for your consent. Because psychologists, as opposed to politicians, make experiments with people only with people's consent. So let me show you a one sign that all of you will be able to recognize. It's about stereotypes. Well, I think, well, see that, see this paper. Everybody sees this paper. Excellent vision. 2020 vision. This is not crypto. It's not cryptocurrency. It's uh, our own, very own Russian currency. So, if I use uh, the method of uh, the best biochemists and dissolve it uh, in the most accurate analysis, will I understand uh, its purchasing power? Please give me an answer. Great, great answer. You're all quite developed people, advanced people. Uh, so, tell me now, please, if I take out uh, the most accurate electronic microscope and start studying this material, will I uh, understand uh, its a source of purchasing power? Please give me an answer. And finally, if I, as a great physiologist, uh, one uh, great physiologist, uh, he uh, loved extirpation, you know, reducing or uh, taking out some pieces of your brain and then observing your behavior. So if I, take and break uh, and tear these things apart. Well, I understand that uh, the pushing power. I'll not do this experiment in, uh, in the physical world for understandable reasons. Just like that, my dear and beloved, however much uh, we study the brain, we're not going to understand uh, where uh, the uh, conscious comes, uh, where or where our individuality stems. There are words that are different, uh, difficult uh, to translate. You can't derive personality from brain. You can't uh, derive consciousness uh, from brain. I asked my Georgian colleague how to translate to the Russian uh, the word gamarjoba. There's uh, such a word in the Georgian language. And he looked at me skeptically and uh, started stalling, saying, how to translate, how to explain. It can be translated, it's uh, like in Russia, uh, my dear, uh, my dear one, but only 1,000 times stronger. 
Same thing applies uh, to the consciousness. Same thing uh, applies, to the, uh, applies to the mind. Is uh, my dear one, but only a thousand times stronger. Please hear me. We're changing very fast. And today I'm accelerating because I feel in a situation of a Cinderella uh, for whom it will, uh, they will say, your time is up. I'm not going to turn into a pumpkin. But look, only a lazy person today is not talking about technology singularity. And here, uh, we uh, get profits all the time, like, as false profits. Uh, I mean, Toffler, for instance, who said the shock of the future, uh, then we get uh, the term of technology singularity. Uh, you uh, must uh, very well remember Kurzweil's work. And now we clearly understand we're living in the time of acceleration. And in this situation, uh, along with technology singularity that uh, we will not be able to explain in any way, you know, uh, I carry things about me as a nation person uh, as opposed to flash drives. Social singularity. Uh, pay attention, uh, the rate of social change is so high uh, that we uh, just uh, can't adapt, and that's the key word. If we adapt, we uh, once we have adapted, we're in the past. Once we have adapted, uh, we follow the dictatorship of past experience, we're going to lose. And from here, look, a simple experiment. Uh, so he, here I have a backpack. So I go to my uh, psychology uh, faculty, psychology department, and then I hear a voice of a student. Uh, I go like this. I'm not touching anyone. And then uh, uh, some student says, something happening with a small of, look, uh, he is uh, trying to look like a Western professor. And another one says, look, forget about it. He just wants uh, to look like a young one. And now look at how the world has changed. And so look around yourself in the street. Have you seen people driving those, how to call them? I forget the name. Uh, uh, boards and also these things. Uh, I walk and I see a guy with a mane in the wind, uh, a guy of the same age like myself, like a Hemingway uh, on a board, like colleagues, the world is changing, on a scooter, uh, colleagues, the world is changing. Uh, that's the happiness of our time. We're falling back into childhood, how we walk, how we move, look at ourselves. Take off uh, your eyeglasses and stereotypes. Forget about the apocalypse. We, our children, the drama of education, the key drama of the 21st century is in lagging behind of ourselves as teachers from myself, from our team, from our students, from our children. They already live in the world dominated by uh, what has come uh, to be called digital mind. They live in this world, whereas we uh, find ourselves in a position where we have to learn to live in that. And the laws here are absolutely different. Everything's different. What's the reason for me to be a neurocognitive optimist. Well, my reason is simple. And it was mentioned yesterday in one of the sessions. Only total, and the word total is key, a change in education. A total change in education. I am repeating them, repeating this here and now, is the foundation for optimism. So therefore, the only question uh, that exists is how is going to happen? And in conclusion, I understand uh, your uh, gentle non-verbal message. How it's going to become, what it's going to become. And here, as uh, another uh, popular uh, 
character in uh, Russian literature said, I'm not going to uh, spread uh, the porridge over the table. I'll just uh, tell you one thing. The key characteristic of any educational system uh, uh, is the same as the key characteristics of leaders. The one that has the biggest predicative effect. The key predicative outcome. A leader is not the one who's authoritarian. Or, let me, uh, with all my love to democracy, say, is not the one who is most democratic. A leader is the one, and I quote uh, my idol, Elio Vygotsky. So I'll say this, a leader is the one who uh, can, who is able uh, to determine uh, the zone of close to development of their employees. A leader is uh, a master of predictive effect. So I'm looking at the competition of complex systems. I'm just looking up. Uh, the key uh, the, there are different systems. A predictive brain is one thing, uh, one system, and a unique characteristic of the brain. So I'm having a book, Predictive Mind. Uh, it's not by chance that they called it. You have to find out, look for answers here. And uh, predictive is uh, the one where you don't have ready-made algorithms. Uh, so for you uh, to believe that, two questions to finish with. Education without ready-made algorithms. Yesterday, the masters of art, of uh, intellect, and I uh, analyzed them especially before today's presentation. Uh, they uh, mentioned a great joke of the past. Uh, what program are you? building, they asked a coder. I don't know, he said, once it starts working, then I'll see what it does. So what kind of education are you building? Today's education uh, should be a school of uncertainty. Today's education uh, should be a school of uh, behavior in uncertain situation, in the situation of uncertainty. Uh, when at Physics and Technology University a few years ago they were passing a math exam, uh, what happened is nobody was able to solve a problem at an exam, at the exam. Why? Because there was an error when composing uh, uh, the uh, problem. It would seem that uh, the one who says uh, there's a condition missing and uh, therefore there's no condition uh, would win. But nothing happened. Because in the school, uh, back at school, uh, we uh, keep setting uh, problems uh, where everything is uh, defined, bringing about stereotypes. The best. Uh, diagnostic of our education. Uh, so our education is not uh, actually training, but pre-adaptation. And what is pre-adaptation? I can quote one of my great interlocutors that many of you have seen, Victor Chernomirdian. He said, we're living in the world where uh, when uh, something never existed, uh, but then it comes up again. So, the most important thing is uh, to be a, a vire for our children, not, to, uh, not being afraid uh, to ask questions, uh, not to be afraid asking questions, uh, to laugh, uh, not to be afraid of the carnival, uh, not to be afraid of uh, facing non-adaptive uh, tasks. Uh, what would make a, a human different uh, from an animal had they only been content uh, to have what's necessary? and nothing on top of that. And in conclusion, one small question, one more question that I always ask is just like a small test. Diagnostic of education is diagnostic of uh, test tolerance uh, for uh, uncertainty. My favorite word, tolerance, uh, for which uh, uh, some uh, of uh, people in uh, the internet called me tolerant. So, I'm looking at this audience and I'm asking a question. Please tell me, 
are there people in the audience? And I'm looking at you as well. Who oh, were asked a question some time ago, some time in the past? What? Uh, is there more for you there than anybody else? Please raise your hand. With this, thank you very much. Uh, my dear non-adaptive people, so you don't have to fear uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Asimov. Well, you responded to the questions, and you asked a lot of questions. Uh, and one of the issues that you described is something that I can relate to. We would be able, well, you use that banknote, would we be able to figure out how our brain operates? Uh, and as you said, we do not want to for one reason or another. I'd like to thank all the speakers, uh, these brilliant scientists have shared their ideas with us uh, in a clear way. I just have a couple of questions. I think my first question would go to Stephen. Uh, Stephen, you work with major companies, you consult uh, corporations, and you might have seen very good practices of leadership development. What are the practices? What companies first, and what are the practices that you have witnessed to develop leaders? Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to apologize to the audience of not standing up. You may think that I have some type of a disease, but I was confused by the microphone, and I didn't hear what was going on. So my apologies, first of all. Um, also, thank you for bringing me in this exquisite company of great minds. I would love to have uh, further conversations and dialogues with you. So, to come to your question, um, I think uh, the, the, sort of the practice that we still see in, in many organizations is to develop people through training and development. Um, I think the new tweak is uh, there's more and more individualized customized learning through um, the figure of the coach and the mentor. Uh, there's a clear tendency that uh, the traditional training and development programs where there's a professor who transmits ideas is complemented by a figure which customizes, which individualizes learning, um, focuses on the individual, their backgrounds, their talents, um, and, and try to work with people on the individual level. Uh, the other thing that I see as a clear tendency is that we move away from um, developing people's competencies or skills and more and more exposing um, professionals to experience. So I think we are evolving from a competency-based training and development where we develop skills to um, a training and development through experiences. How do we do, uh, or how do companies do that? Actually expose these professionals to very different um, environments. Um, give them, as my dear colleague calls it, um, a first-person experience. Uh, the only way, really, I think that we can get a complete and deep understanding of reality is to live it ourselves. So think of rotation programs where professionals rotate through different uh, departments, get a first-person experience of what it is to work in marketing or to work in finance. Work with these colleagues, develop uh, a shared mental map, and so to become much more sophisticated through experience. Uh, that, what does that mean also that in order to develop people's um, um, capabilities, we have to expose them as much as possible to different environments. Uh, what I would do as a leader is to make sure that I create opportunities for the talented people in my company to be exposed to very different um, experiences so they can live and develop their own neural networks, not just from hearsay, but from personal experience. And personal experience is not just about thought, 
It's about emotion. It's about interconnections. It goes much further. So this would be uh, my answer of what's, what is going on now and where it is going. Thank you, Stephen. So we all agree that the education system needs to uh, evolve, starting with the architecture. That's what uh, um, Ms. Chernigovska spoke about, Mr. Smolov said, and also the, all, the doctrine has to change. There should be no more professor-student relationship, but a closer relationship. I have a question to Ms. Chernigovska. When we talk about physical development, we all understand what has to do. You have to go to gym, you have to do jogging, you have to get a coach for to develop your fitness level. What about brain development? You mentioned that you can do IQ tests, but it doesn't uh, make sense. But what, m what does make sense? What should we do to train our brain? Well, I can give you some basic things. Our brain, just like muscles, needs to work hard. If we lie down on a couch and if we keep lying there on uh, for uh, six months, we won't be able to get up. If uh, you're going to be in a bad company, if you're going to listen to light, uh, senseless music, uh, watch stupid movies, uh, don't read uh, good books, uh, then you'll have nothing to complain. So the brain has to work hard. So that's, that's a very important thing. It, you have to make it difficult for the brain. It might be light reading for someone else, but it might be difficult for you. But the brain has to strain. It could be a movie that I don't understand. It means that I'm going to listen to some critical articles, reviews. If I'm going to, if I'm in a theatre, I have to think about this uh, particular play. So our brain has to be busy. It has to be engaged all the time. So if you always continue calculating, yes, you'll be able, you'll be good at math, but it will not develop your brain in general. So my answer would be as follows. If you have small children, you have to teach them everything because you never know who is born. It's like an alien. You start from scratch. You don't know who they are. It's a and they don't know who they are. But in order to be able to uncover who they are, they need to try, try everything. They need to try dancing, uh, sports, uh, singing. Uh, and then you're going to see what they are cut out for. And then you have to help them. It's not your choice. It's their choice. You cannot force children to choose. Now, if we read biographies of um, outstanding people, take Darwin. What was boys supposed to do, be a lawyer or a doctor? That was the alternative they had. What about that Darwin? He got on Beagle and then he went around the world. And that's why we have Darwin and not another lawyer or a doctor. So don't look at the tricks that might improve your brain. <laughs> Life is the best trick. Life is the best train of your brain. Thank you so much, Mr. Nigovska. So we definitely deal with challenging issues and, uh, today, and this session helps to improve our brain. OK, uh, I'd just like to add one thing. When you took out that bank note, so if you're going to dissolve it to cut it out, Mr. Lotman, that I uh, had a chance to work with, he used a very good metaphor. It did get science. Well, yes, you can uh, uh, take, cut out a bull on uh, several stakes, but you won't be able to assemble those stakes again in a bull. So I've got these debates with my colleagues uh, for a number of years. They say, again, we're going to have a hardware that would be able to show us every neuron. Well, I don't want to see every neuron. There are like 100 billions. What are you going to do with the info on the, each neuron? It won't uh, be able to respond to any question, except for some specific questions on how a neuron is, uh, can, what would it consist of. But these are quite different answers. Our questions cannot be answered by that. 
Well, they might find a gene that is in charge of intention or a gene that's in charge of singing, a gene that's in charge of love. Well, I found an excellent article. Where is orgasm in your brain? And there are colorful pictures, but these are different pictures, you know? Well, it's like people are going crazy. We're always looking for some bits. Where is the spoon? Where's the fork? We're singing in that brain. But that's ridiculous. It don't, won't be able to answer any of the serious questions. It's, it's just wasting your energy in the worst possible sense. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Smolov, throughout the billions of years of evolution, we do have a lot of automatic uh, responses, or reactions, and many have helped us in life, but some are wrong for life. We're not in a forest, we're not hunting mammoths, mammoths and in a business life, many of the responses do bad for us. So can we train our re reactions? Can we do some something with it? So that we don't, uh, we're not guided by primitive uh, re reactions, but by our logic and thought. What can you advise? Well, it's hard to speak after the last words of Ms. Uh, Chernigovskaya. Uh, when you spoke of uh, orgasm, you've excited me, you've turned me on. And, and in response to that, here's what I'm going to say, colleagues. Do we need to get rid of stereotypes? What about traditions? What about rituals? What about uh, rights? routine, archaic reductions. Well, it's a very important question. The more we master a routine uh, skills, then we can then pass it on to AI and other smart systems. But at the same time, I'd like to understand how do we get rid of them? We need to be exposed to unusual situations. We need to be exposed to unusual ecosystems. We need to get out of comfort zones. We need to go beyond these frameworks. We need to go out of the box. But you have to run the risk, and that risk has to be the environment for your development. You shouldn't yell and shout uh, like William Beck, oh, we are in, uh, we found ourselves in a soup, or we found ourselves uh, in the uh, environment of a risk. It's actually, it's our reality. We live in the era of changes. There will be no other era. So the first rule is as follows. You, routine reactions uh, is your armor. You, oft, you need to expose yourself to exclusive situations where you don't have any shortcuts. And the brain will then explore the ways out. And you need to understand that you always can have not a kind of a tutor, not a teacher, but but then again, addressing, referencing Chaplin, you can have tricksters, jokers, that would change the situation. So when you find a leader, someone trickster, when you find such a leader, they will help you to liberate yourself. In evolution, the key concept, the Goldschmidt, Goldschmidt concept, it's about murmurs and it's the uh, hopeful monsters. So if we are not afraid to be hopeful monsters and to, as long as we still support this variety, diversity, as long as we are, we are able to find new niches, then this is the way forward. We need to accumulate emergent cultural practices. I don't want to talk about brainstorm.
But here's the main answer. You need to read complicated sci-fi. Neil Gaiman gave the following description. So who are the best leaders in Google, at Google, who are the best researchers at Google and Microsoft? So it turned out these are the children who, before 15, 17 years of age, loved reading serious pre-adaptive sci-fi. And that has yielded unique results. Read sci-fi, don't afraid to be hobbits, or, or Harry Potter, and you'll be fine. You'll succeed. Thank you. Do we have time for one or two questions? Okay, one or two questions. You, I see some of the hands going up in the air. Uh, my name is Dina Rachenko. I'm a cognitive pessimist. So F Freud was once asked, like on the eve of World War I, a French cultural figure like Raman Rolan wrote to him, why do I have the war? You are a specialist of the souls. And he said, civilization is all about machines, means of production, but psychology doesn't evolve. You're still guided by two instincts. You need to uh, self-preservation and multiplication. Well, it's interesting, exciting to study your brain, axons and synapses, but maybe we should also focus on instincts because we'll be ruined by greediness and aggression and not by robots. Well, afraid is a friend to me, but truth is uh, more important. The latest studies that were done several years ago yielded unexpected results. Among the fears that were diagnosed the previously, this fear of death used to be the most important fear. The biggest phobia in the 18th century was the phobia of losing the meaning of life. So the latest studies indicate that if you boil down your individuality to your personality to death or hedonistic primitive reactions that Freud talked about, it's narrowing our consciousness too much. I don't say that Freud is wrong, but the window of opportunity has changed for us, and the reality and those re reducing our psyches to the forces described by Freud is presenting our personalities in too much of a flat way. So here's my response. I'm a neurocognitive optimist. Here's my response. Freud is not a friend to me. I hate Freud. I think he actually uh, he actually confused the entire civilization in the 20th century. Now, if you talk to if you well, if I can cite Mr. Bechtereff, uh, several years before Freud. He described basically the same, but okay, that's just an aside. I did an interview yesterday, and there's a crazy idea that's buzzing the world. Are we going to live like for 80 plus years? Can we live in, uh, until we are 130 years of age? Here's my response to that. You might remember there was a wonderful book, a person in the search for a meaning of life. We so, if you don't have any meaning in life, but you're always revived and you're like a quash living there, 
like a vegetable and to the horror of yourself, to the horror of your community, to your family, then why do you leave? And definitely it's not much, it's not only the instinct. We definitely are guided by instincts. Yeah, I'm not an idiot. Yeah, we do have this instinct, but there's much more. You cannot boil it down to these uh, primitive things, rudimentary things. This is, I have bad attitude to fried. Well, very brief comment. We just need to have fun. A doctor is asked by a patient. It's a joke. Will I leave? And the doctor says, what's the point? Thank you. I completely agree with my colleagues. And I would like to quote uh, the work of Jak Panksep. Jak Panksep is an effective neuroscientist, and he has done a, a tremendous job in mapping the neural circuitries and the associated neurotransmitters, and really reconstructing all the emotions that a human being and all mammals actually have. First of all, he, he discovers that, um, contrary to what you see in a lot of uh, popular magazines, the basic emotions are not generated in the limbic system. They're interpreted, they're interconnected in the limbic system, but they're generated in the brainstem. So we're talking about the most primitive part of the brain, the brainstem. And indeed, he found some of those basic uh, emotions like anger and panic, those negative emotions that uh, make us um, yeah, basically respond in an action-reaction way. But the most fascinating thing is he also reveals two types of emotions, if, if you can use the word emotions, we, don't, we wouldn't even use the word emotion. The very first and most important thing that drives people, and that he also discovered in this most primitive part of the brain, is curiosity, is learning new things, is exploring. This is why you are here today. You are curious, you have questions. Um, yesterday I had a wonderful interview and I, and I complimented the journalist because I said, your questions were much better than my answers. This is what it is all about, right? Being curious, asking the right questions. The other uh, emotion, which we wouldn't even call emotion, that Jak Panksep revealed, is play. Yeah, we, who would ever thought that that's an emotion? But you know, just look at young children. If you leave them alone just for two seconds, they're playing. It's an intrinsic drift drive. And why do we play? Why do we play, right? You could say, okay, it's a biological drive to try out new habits and you know, fights with your mother, so you learn about how to stalk um, and how to, you know, attack a prey. But I think it goes beyond that. Um, we have built in, in our most primitive part of the brain the capability of playing, of choking, of using humor, of, um, you know, using irony. And, and that's uh, the other thing I think that um, determines us as human beings, our capability to self relativize to laugh at ourselves. Uh, Jak Panksep also revealed that, um, and this is, was quite uh, uh, amazing, uh, he published a very serious paper in a very serious journal, so I'm not joking here. He discovered that rats, the rats that we've been using in uh, experiments to discover more about the brain, laugh. They laugh. They can say ha ha ha, right? <laughs> That's amazing, right? Um, this is something I think we should uh, recapture. This is what I think defines the human being. The capability to laugh, to laugh and to be curious. Thank you so much. One more question. Just one more question. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the speakers. I'm as a documentary director. It looked like a two-hour movie and your fantasy was bursting and I wish that movie didn't end. So uh, yesterday I left with a question, what do I want most? So here's my question. 
Do you feel that in our memory we only limit, we, we store only some limited information on the cause and consequences? And is the brain more of a subject or an object in terms of perception, memory, and retention of some of those uh, relationship between causes and uh, uh, and consequences. I'm a philosopher. I'm a young scientist, and you define the context where science matters. Well, Mr. Smolov uh, wants me to uh, say to speak first. Ladies first. He waved to me. So. We always talk about consciousness. So what consciousness is? Now, you're, in referencing your question, what logic is. Now, there's a specialist, Sir Roger Pendrose. A couple of years ago, he started studying consciousness. He came to a workshop uh, that I was doing. And he says that consciousness is a phenomenon that it doesn't fit the physical picture of the world, the physical framework of the world. Yeah, it's like it's pointless cutting the banknote and trying to figure out what's inside. So we have two ways out of it. Option number one is trying to put consciousness into that physical world. And option two is horrible, change the physical picture of the world. But no one in their my sober minds would be able to do it. He says that consciousness is quantum leaps. Again, I don't know whether it's for good or bad. It just means that in quantum world, logic non-exists. Causality it doesn't exist. Okay, we're not, we don't know whether we're trained or whether it exists. If you talk about children, they have a different logic. All, cha all children's psychology is different. Water do doesn't flow because the tap is open. No, it's the floor, it's the tap is open because the water flows. You know, the the entire logic is upside down. So it's quite a complicated question that you asked. Well, that's a very complicated question. I agree. I follow your logic. I have a formula. Your, your question is so good that I don't want to spoil it with my answer. Okay, very briefly, jokes aside, first, I'm really serious. All these studies that we see today revealed that rational thinking is a limited concept. It's just one of the paths of our brain. There are other logics, other ways that our brain uses our paths that our brain uses. Not only children, us too. We too often use other ways of thinking, like myths, poetic thinking. Children have so many opportunities, so much uncertainty about our children's future. What is our future path? It's a history of uh, the alternatives that were denied by us. So Nick Eniman and other analysts say that if we only analyze the trends, that's bad. It's bad if we are slaves of our previous experience. So myths and poets, myths and poetic thinking, that's the way forward, I guess. Art, the more just tricksters and jesters we have, the better for our children. Something extraordinary, some fairy tales. 
Our nation has a lot of myths. Uh, they have a lot of thinking that's related to myths. So when we were asked to back in our childhood years, so, uh, you know, you remember we had Lenin face on, on our label when we were part of the youth communist movement. And when we asked, who is that? We always told them, we, Grandfather Lenin. So, so that's the way we continue to live with those uh, gray head uh, Lenins on our labels. Um, well, after these two interventions, I want to go home and just think about what I just heard. Um, first of all, I think memories are tricky. We know from research that memories are constructed, reconstructed, are socially constructed. Um, just as a piece of proof, um, right after uh, the attacks on the Twin Towers in the United States, people were interviewed right after this uh, attack. Those interviews were recorded on tape. Um, many years later, these same people were asked in again to recount their memories and it completely deviated from their first accounts. Even more, when they were confronted with their own tape recordings, they couldn't believe it. So, first of all, be aware that memories are constructed, are reconstructed, are socially constructed. Which then leads to the second question, which is, what happens with the truth? We are in a major crisis at this point in time in history, where falsehoods are told as truths, where fake news wins over truth. That is truly worrying. I would say you are responsible of constructing your memories. What I would recommend you is to be mindful of the here and now, to be a truthful recorder of what happens here and now. And it's not just about the truth, it's actually also about happiness. If we look at uh, some of the research um, that has been done about mindfulness and happiness, uh, there's a researcher um, out of Harvard um, University, Dan Gilbert, Daniel Gilbert, who is a scholar of happiness. Um, he used a technique to actually ask people in the moment uh, itself, it's called experience sampling. So imagine you have a, a cell phone and at any point in time you can get a, a message and three questions will be asked to you. What are you doing? What are you thinking? And what do you feel? The research shows that, first of all, in over 60% of cases, people are not doing what they're thinking. So, what are they thinking about then? Well, typically we're thinking of the future or the past. Trying to understand the past and um, re sort of recounting ourselves what we didn't do so well. Or thinking about the future, right? This great capability of the human being of simulating what is not there yet, which makes us also uniquely human. Those people who reported that they were doing what they were thinking also reported much more positive emotions. Happiness is in the here and now. So I would, rec I would recommend to you to be much more mindful, to live the here and now, not just for the purpose of truth, but also for the purpose of happiness. Thank you so much, colleagues. So we have three brilliant speakers, and definitely we have much, many more questions, but time has run out a long time ago. I'd like to thank all the speakers once again for their insightful and exciting uh, interventions. Thank you for your ideas. Thank you for the insights that we take away. And thank you for the humor that you've used to spice up all of the ideas. Thank you.